friends, welcome to the Christ Community Church Brawley podcast, where you get the chance to hear stories of the gospel changing lives and so much more like praise reports, Q&A, and other fun conversations. And today, later in this episode, we're actually going to be introducing a new co-host for the rest of the show. So I'm really excited for you to see who that is. Today, our interview is with Mr. Caleb Dobrinich, and he has a fantastic story about how God has changed his life and about where the Lord has placed him now. And I think you're really going to enjoy our conversation. So let's bring you into that now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Christ Community Church Brawley podcast, where you guys get the opportunity to hear stories of the gospel changing lives and so much more. And today we have our guest, Mr. Caleb Dobrinich. And it is so exciting to have you here in particular because of what the Lord has recently done in your life and stepping into a new role. And so I think you guys are going to really enjoy this conversation. And so, Caleb, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Sean. Of course. And so before we dive into the interview questions and getting to hear your story about who you were before the Lord saved you and and how that happened and where you're at now, we have some fun questions for you. Sounds good. We want to get to know Caleb. Who is Caleb? And so first question is, what is your favorite food and drink? So my favorite food would probably be Mexican food, which um, I know is more of a... That's broad. Broad, but um, I guess it would probably honestly just be a basic carne asada burrito. So before coming to the Valley, I was not really exposed to Mexican food that much. Poor soul. So um, it's all pretty new to me, but I love it. And so honestly, my favorite drink too, coming to the Valley the first time I tried was horchata. Nice. And I've loved it. So. Have you ever had a special quesadilla? Um, no, but I've had an empanada, and I heard that's somewhat similar. We need to get this guy a special quesadilla. Yeah. Okay, second question is, favorite place you've ever been to, and then where would you love to go? So the, my favorite place I've ever been to is Costa Rica. And nice. It was, it was beautiful. But a place I'd really like to go to is Israel. Mm. Um, I've never, I've heard many testimonies about how great it is for your walk and just, it's a beautiful place to visit and I haven't had that opportunity yet, but that's somewhere I am. Yeah. Gosh, Israel is really life changing. You know, we hear, or what's common is for two week trips, right? Two day travel, 10 day tour, two day travel back. And, um, I had the opportunity to be there for three months and that was overwhelming. Yeah. And so when I hear about 10 day tours, I'm like, oh my goodness, unless you strap a GoPro to your head yeah. and capture everything, I don't know how you can uh, retain all of that. Yeah. But yes, I, I pray that the Lord opens that opportunity yeah. for you to do that. And maybe we can even do that together. Who That'd knows? be awesome. Yeah. Uh, third question is favorite show or movie? All right. So my favorite show is The Office. And me and Sean were just talking about that. I think that's also his favorite. And my favorite <laughs> movie is Interstellar. Okay, I'd never seen Interstellar. Yes. Uh. Before we started recording today, um, I'm just going to say we were laughing uncontrollably, yeah. and there were many office, office references made. And this past Father's Day, my wife got me some really sweet shirts that is also an office reference. So you can yep. go to my Instagram and check that out. Okay, last fun question before we dive into your story is what are you learning right now, or what are you most curious about? So right now with uh, the new position I'm moving into, which we'll talk about more later, but um, I've been digging into how uh, youth ministry operates and how to do that. And I've been interviewing some youth pastors. And awesome. So that's something that I've been learning more about lately. And it's been very fun, very interesting. Very cool. And so as we start segueing into your story, as some of you may know by now, as this goes uh, to be published and posted on July 1st, is that the Lord's actually raised up Caleb Dobrinich as the new youth director here at Christ Community Church Brawley. And we are so excited to see many teenagers be reached through evangelism and raised up through discipleship mm-hmm. and the youth ministry work that Caleb and his team are going to be putting together. And so definitely stay tuned about when a youth ministry launches here and just all the different things that are going to be taking place with yep. that. But before we got to where we're at now, you were in a very different situation of life. And so what was your upbringing like? And maybe describe your life before you came to Jesus. Okay, so my upbringing was interesting in that um, I was, so I was born in Sandy, Utah, which is right outside of Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. I was born on February 14th, 2001. So I'm 21 years old. And um, 
my parents, both my biological parents, were uh, raised in the LDS church, also known as the Mormon church. Okay. And, um, but when I was born, both of my parents were also addicted to drugs. Mm. My mom had me when she was 23, and uh, shortly after, um, I was removed from her custody, and thankfully not put into foster care, but instead mm-hmm. I was given to my grandfather, who uh, raised me for about a year. And then when I was given back to my mother, she had moved to Santa Cruz, California, with another man, and they had both gotten sober together, and mm-hmm. they were, um, they had been sober for about a year, so I was given back to her, and then they actually found Christ through Celebrate Recovery. Okay. And so my mom finished nursing school, my dad was working as an electrician, and they kind of, because of their addiction, they had to start from nothing. So mm-hmm. growing up in Santa Cruz, we had very little, it was um, a very tough period of life for my parents and for myself. But then uh, when my mom finished nursing school and my dad actually started his own electrical company um, and they were we were going to church and at five years old, my st- well, they got married when I was three. Then mm-hmm. at five years old, my stepfather adopted me as his son. And around that same time, my mom got pregnant and then uh, nine months later had twins. It mm-hmm. was my little brother and sister. And then at that time... Um, I guess you could say they began to prosper. The Their jobs were going well, and we were mm-hmm. able to move out of Santa Cruz and to Temecula. And so this is kind of a point in my life where um, things got different in, in that um, we were your average American evangelical family in that mm-hmm. we went to church on Sundays and we prayed before meals. Uh, it was me, my little brother and sister. Both my parents were together, but that was kind of the extent of like our Christian life. Real cultural Christian. Yeah, yeah, but not very devout. There was no mm-hmm. like discipleship happening at home. Yeah. Um, but I, I got the privilege of getting to go to a Christian school from kindergarten to seventh grade. And during that time, you know, like most kids going to church and going to that uh, school, I, I memorized scripture. I, I could articulate the Christian faith. I could tell you what the gospel was, mm-hmm. but I didn't necessarily have my own relationship with Christ. So um, in seventh grade, my father had an affair and mm-hmm. my parents got divorced. And so that's kind of where my own life began to go downhill. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you'd like me to share more about that now. or Yeah, uh, feel free to just you know share whatever comes to mind with regard to your life, and I think that even up to this point, you know, there's a lot of people who are listening or watching who can resonate with your part of the story. Mm-hmm. That um, you know, and similar to my story, that didn't grow up in the best environment. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, an issue with our biological parents, yeah. and and um, and so those who are listening or watching who also come from broken homes mm-hmm. of, of varying degrees or being bounced around different family members, I think that they can really resonate with what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so after my parents got divorced, which was a huge shock for me, yeah. at the same time, um, I stopped going to that Christian school. And so again, mind you, I went there from kindergarten. It was all mm-hmm. I ever knew. Mm-hmm. And I got taken out of that and put into a public school. And then at the same time, um, both my parents stopped attending church, so therefore I stopped attending church. Mm-hmm. And so it was a huge culture shock in every way. And so eighth grade year, I started attending this public school and I have a lot of hurt in my heart from what had happened in my family. Mm -hmm. And I put a lot of the blame on God as, um, you know, as if it was his fault. And, uh, I began to rebel against my parents and against the things that I had been taught Mm -hmm. growing up in the, in the church and at school. And I pretty quickly got introduced to drugs in eighth Mm -hmm. grade. And, it was all downhill from there. Mm. So by my freshman year of high school, I had started, um, I was heavily involved in drugs. I was using pills and marijuana and psychedelics. And I I was kind of the kid that I was down to try anything. Mm -hmm. And um, I was obviously trying to cover up some of the hurt I was feeling. And also I was just really just trying to gratify my flesh. I was seeking thrill and Mm -hmm. trying to have fun. And but as we know, when you sow to the flesh, you reap from the flesh destruction. And that's exactly what happened Um, in the pursuit of fun and and, um, joy. I ended up by sophomore year of high school. I was fully addicted to those pills. And Mm. I junior year of high school, I I graduated high school um, and I began going to a community college because I thought that was going to be a way to like if I could get away from just if 
if I can get away from these friends, mm-hmm. then I'll be okay. Like yeah. they're the problem, right? I wasn't looking at myself. I was mm-hmm. looking at the people around me. They're the problem. And the reality is that no matter where you go, you go with you. Yeah. The person in the mirror is still with you. Yeah. And oftentimes the person in the mirror is the problem Yeah. because uh, you make your own decisions. And, and the, one of the beautiful things, I guess it's a double-edged sword known as free will. Mm-hmm. You know, we can be how you were saying, living a certain lifestyle Mm -hmm. of drugs and and bad decisions. But one of the beautiful things about free will is that one day you can just decide to -hmm. do something different. You can just decide, of course, in the big picture to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, definitely continue and take us further. Yeah, so um, I quickly realized that those friends were not the problem (laughs) because uh, I I moved into this this new school. It was a community college, and very quickly I got introduced to harder drugs, Mm. and I got addicted to those. So I was um, starting to use fentanyl and cocaine. Mm. And um, at this point, both my parents had already gotten remarried to other people, and they both started attending churches, separate churches, but they were both um, with their spouses trying to get back on track, trying to follow the Lord. And I had a little brother and sister who were five years younger than me. And they're at the age where they're, you know, they're being easily influenced by Mm -hmm. my decisions. And I'm not setting a good example at this time. Mm -hmm. So at 18 years old, my parents told me I had to leave. And -hmm. rightly so. You know, they were trying to raise my brother and sister in a godly way. And I was outright against what they believed. I would speak out against... Uh, their beliefs in God and Mm -hmm. I was hostile towards the gospel when they would try and share it with me and so they asked me to leave and so I moved in with a co-worker for a brief period of time and then eventually I got my own apartment with my girlfriend and I started selling drugs and firearms to support the habit that I'd created Mm -hmm. and um, about a year later right before I turned 19 was when I got arrested for selling drugs and firearms understandable yeah (laughs) and so um it was february 7th of 2020 i got arrested and when i was in jail um i tried to call everyone i could think of to bail me out and Mm -hmm. nobody would and um basically what happened is i was sitting in the jail cell alone i had gotten basically i went from holding into like the actual jail Mm -hmm. and so i'm laying in my bed at that night and i was just thinking like wow, like, I can't believe what my life has come to. Mm-hmm. I'm nine, I'm b- barely about to turn 19 years old, and I'm in jail for some pretty serious things. Mm. And I realized that that's not what I wanted for my life. That's not what my loved ones wanted for my life. Yeah. <clears throat> and at that moment, I, I cried out to God. But it wasn't a, looking back, it wasn't a um, a prayer of repentance and faith in Christ Mm. it was more just like God if you're real like help me out please like Mm -hmm. I promise I'll start going to church yeah and um so it wasn't a salvific moment Mm -hmm. but it was a moment where um with childlike faith I just trusted in God I just like I I prayed and I was hopeful that God would answer that prayer Mm -hmm. and so a couple weeks later I turned 19 in jail a few days later I called my mom just to say hi and she told me that um, they found a program that I could go to. And if I was willing to go to this program, then they would help me out. Mm-hmm. And so I just said, yes, I didn't know what the program was. I didn't know where I was going. I just knew I didn't want to be in jail. Yes. So I said, yes. And so they um, bailed me out and they took me to a program called New Creations Men's Home, which wow. is in Imperial Valley, El Centro. And later on, I found out that what happened was while I was in jail, a man who had graduated that home a couple years prior was in Temecula, which is a couple hundred miles away from El Centro. Mm -hmm. And he happened to be there giving his testimony of how God saved him in New Creations. And so after hearing his testimony, my stepfather went up to him and told him my situation. And he got them in contact with Pastor Ramon Lopez. Mm -hmm. And that's how they found out that um about new creations yeah and so god was sovereignly working all this out you know while Mm -hmm. i'm sitting in jail and so it's amazing how you know for your particular situation you like you said are sitting in jail Mm -hmm. as you know there's only so many places you can go a few feet here a few feet there yeah but god is always up to something Mm -hmm. god is always 
behind the scenes, behind the curtain, working things out. And Romans yeah. eight twenty eight says, Paul says, and we know that all things work together for the good yep. to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And Caleb is called according to God's purpose. And what you did in selling guns and drugs was obviously not good, yeah. but the Bible teaches that God works out all things for mm-hmm. good. And so he had you arrested, yeah. placed in that particular cell, yep. and was working in the background, orchestrating new creations and the individual who's mm-hmm. speaking and your parents to get you connected yep. with the healing yep. and the the environment that you needed yeah. to get whole and healed and then to thrive yeah. and grow. Yeah, he had to allow me to hit rock bottom yeah. so I could humble, be humbled, and that way I would um, cry out to him. And for our audience, you know, those who are watching, listening, you know, some people may be in their own crisis yeah. right now. Uh, or maybe they, like you, had more or less of a Christian upbringing. You know, you went to a Christian school from kinder to seventh grade. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah. And, you know, maybe there's some people who are listening who had a Christian upbringing. Mm-hmm. They know the Word. They know yeah. the Gospel. They they sang the songs, did the yep. things, went yep. to VBS. Like, we're, yep. you know, we... Uh, as a, I did all that. <laughs> yeah. And so, but then they walk away. Mm-hmm. And so to that person who's listening or watching, just know that, there's hope for you Mm -hmm. that no matter how far you've gone, you know, I think of the prodigal son and the prodigal son obviously had a brother who was ungrateful uh, for the other prodigal son's salvation and coming home. But the part of that story where the prodigal son took his inheritance early, which basically saying, dad, you're dead to me Mm -hmm. because that inheritance was to be upon the father's passing. Mm -hmm. And he takes in his inheritance early, leaves to a far off country where he should not have gone and doing things that he should not have done. Mm -hmm. And yet when he returned home, he was always a son. He never stopped being a son. And the father was waiting every Mm -hmm. day, the Bible says, waiting for his son to come home Mm -hmm. and embraced him. And the son had prepared this whole speech, right? You know the text, and he prepared this speech, and the father didn't even let him have an opportunity to share that speech with him. You know, I know my dad has servants, and I can be one of the servants, and I'll be fine. And obviously we know how the story goes, you know, got clothed, and they put on a whole party, and it was Mm -hmm. a celebration. But what just comes to mind is that the whole time God never left you. Yeah. The whole time he was pursuing you, yeah. he was thinking about you, he was working things out in the background on your behalf, mm-hmm. even though you were doing the things that you were doing. Yeah. And to those of you listening or watching, I you might be doing some things that you know that you shouldn't be. You might be living a lifestyle you know that you shouldn't. And and you know that, right? God has put a moral compass within you because you're made in God's image and you know mm-hmm. the things that God's called you to do. And maybe you feel like you're a far off in your relationship with the Lord. You know yeah. it's right. But you're not doing what's right. Yeah. And just know that God always has open arms for you, yeah. just like the father in the prodigal son narrative. Yeah. And so yeah. anyways, those are just some real big picture uh, Bible truths. I think that's important for yeah. all of us. Yeah, there, but there's no one too good that they don't need a savior. Mm-hmm. And there's no one too far gone that they can't be saved. Yeah. So whether you grew up in church, you still need a savior. Yep. And if you're far off, y- you can still be saved. Romans 3.23, for all yeah. have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so continue further. Take us further. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, I don't believe that that prayer I prayed in jail was a moment of salvation. So Mm. um, I I get bailed out by my parents. They took me directly to New Creations, and I was very broken, right? Mm. I... And I was beginning to see God's goodness. I saw, like, it was undeniable to me that he answered that prayer, yeah. almost exactly how I prayed it. And so I knew that he was working, but I, I didn't quite yet surrender. Mm-hmm. But then that Sunday on, at service, it was February 28th of 2020, mm. um, we were at church. At these the, are big moments for you. Yeah, yeah, these are turning points in my life. Yeah. And so um, we are at the Christ Community Church in El Centro, and I heard the message, and the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that mm-hmm. brings us to repentance. Yeah. And I was reflecting on all the times that I should have died, all the mm. times that you know He protected me and He was watching over me. And I just had this overwhelming feeling of knowing that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Mm-hmm. And looking back at this time, I knew nothing of doctrine. I knew nothing of religion. It was just purely, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That was essentially my prayer. And so I went up to the altar, and I just wept. And Mm -hmm. I just asked God, 
like to forgive me. Mm-hmm. And it was it was pure in the sense that, like I said, I didn't know the doc. I just knew that like I was a sinner. I needed to be saved. Mm-hmm. And it was at that moment that Christ entered me, that his spirit filled me and I was born again. Mm. And, and I don't say that because I had a, a fuzzy feeling at the moment. Sure. But what happens is I can look back at that point in my life and say something happened on that day that was radical. Like yeah. my life since then has been radically different. Yeah. And the way I describe it is I went from a man who hated God and loved my sin to a man who now loved God and hated my sin. Mm. And for any fallen human being, that is radical. Yeah, absolutely. So. I think of, you know, what Jesus says in Matthew 7, how you'll know people by their fruits. Mm-hmm. And one of the indicators that someone's confession is real, and by confession we refer to, you know, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, where Paul says to the Romans that if you confess mm-hmm. with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, mm-hmm. you will be saved. In yep. Romans ten thirteen, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's yep. exactly what you did, yeah. February 23rd, 28th, 28th of mm-hmm. 20, 2020. 2020. And so right on the cusp of the lockdowns yes. and pandemic, Yeah, so that's right? another way I see God's goodness. I got into New Creations two weeks before they had to shut wow. the doors. And nobody was allowed in for a few months after that. Again, God's providence in yeah. your life. And, and so you made that confession of faith on February 28th, 2020 at Christ Community Church in El Centro. And the evidence was your, your changed the command center of your soul. You thought mm-hmm. differently, you know, lived differently. I became a new creature. You in became Christ. a new creation, right? As the Bible says yeah. in Second Corinthians five seventeen, all those who are now in Christ are now new creations. Yeah. It's not that Jesus came to make bad people good. Mm-hmm. He came to make dead people live. Yep. He didn't come to just improve your life. He came to rid you of your old life mm-hmm. and bring you a totally new life yep. and be a new creation. Not just a better creation, a yep. brand new creation. Yep. And so, you know, Matthew 7, Jesus says, you'll know people by their fruits. And the evidence that Caleb's confession was true is the changed life. And mm-hmm. so, on that note, tell us what were some changes that began to take place now uh, in your life after that confession was made? So after that confession was made, that was in my first week of being at New Creations. And um, New Creations Men's Home is a 16-month program. So I still, and it's a, it's a discipleship home. It, mm-hmm. It's it's mostly known for a place where drug addicts go, but really it's it's a discipleship home. Mm-hmm. So I, I tell people, anybody who wants to be discipled in a very deep way, I, I would recommend going there <laughs> yeah. for even just six months. But, um, but anyways, so I still had a long ways to go. The, the sanctification process was just beginning. Sure. And w- some things I started to notice about myself that were different was I had a hunger to read God's Word, which I had never had mm-hmm. before. And nobody had to tell me, yeah. you know, you should be reading your Bible. There was just this I- innate, like, need in my soul yes. to be filled with God's word. And I began to study it. I began to love it, to cherish it. Mm-hmm. Um, I began to enjoy being in prayer. And in this program, there is mandatory times of prayer, but I began to want to go beyond that and mm-hmm. spend more time in prayer. I, I enjoyed being in the presence of my Savior. Mm-hmm. And to even say those words is like, you know, a few years ago, I would have, I used to think people that talked like that were crazy. Yeah. You know, I used to laugh at that, but that's me now, you know? Yeah. And so I just began to notice those changes, and I began to notice that um, my relationship with my parents was being restored. My relationship with my siblings was being restored. I was learning how to submit to authority, which mm-hmm. was something I'd always struggled with. I was, I had this, this, um, this love in my heart that I was able to give to others that I didn't have before. And so all these things are beginning to change. And sometimes it's almost like uncomfortable. It's like, man, who have I become? Mm -hmm. You know, in a good way, but it's just like crazy. And so those are kind of some of the things that began to happen. And then, of course, in that program, you have leaders and pastors who are directly discipling you Mm -hmm. day and night. You know, you live in this place and they're there from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to (laughs) sleep. And basically the way it works is in the morning you wake up, you pray. You eat your breakfast, and then you have a couple classes where they teach you God's Word. You go to work for a few hours, you come back, you eat dinner, and then you have another class Mm -hmm. on God's Word, and then you pray and go to bed. And it's like that for 16 months. And I love how you classify it not so much as a rehab home, but as a discipleship Mm -hmm. home, because 
when we talk about the word discipleship in churches, many times what comes to people's minds is you're going to a class or mm-hmm. you're reading a book together or, you know, those more educational knowledge mm-hmm. pieces, which that is a part of discipleship. But when you look at biblical discipleship, yeah. like with Jesus, yeah. he literally had 12 guys live with him yeah. for over three years, and they went everywhere together. Like you were saying, they yeah. ate together, prayed together, yeah. served together. You know, they were t- doing all of these things together. And yeah. so it's important for us as the church to have a biblical understanding mm-hmm. of discipleship versus just learning a few more things. Yeah. That discipleship is doing life with each other, yeah. sharing stories, laughing together, going out and serving, being stretched together, taking yeah. steps of faith together. And that's discipleship, doing life together, which is one of our main phrases here at Christ Community Church, doing life together. And so uh, fast forward a little bit more. What has God done in your life since then? Yeah, so coming up to the end of um, my—so the way the program works is you spend a year as a student and four months as an intern. Um, Because of the pandemic, there was less people in the home, so I became an intern at eight months. So I basically did eight months as a student, eight months as an intern. And towards the end of my stay there— um, they had come to me and asked me what I wanted to do when I graduated, mm-hmm. like regarding work. And I had been praying about that prior, and I I knew that God was calling me to ministry, but I didn't know what. So in my mind, I'm thinking, like, when I get out of here, I'm going to go to Africa, and I'm going to live <laughs> in a mud hut, and I'm just going to preach the gospel. <laughs> right? And Which is some people's <laughs> call. Yeah, it is. But but um, I think Paul Washer said that most Christians, when they get converted, need to be locked away for about a year because they're just so, like, zealous. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> it's zeal without wisdom equals frustration. Yeah, so that's kind of where I was at. So, um, you know, as they come to me and they ask, like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. I just feel called to ministry. And they were kind of like, well, um, okay, but there's not really, like, a position available right now at the church. I was like even if it's just cutting the grass or cleaning the toilets. You just wanted to serve Jesus. Yeah, I just wanted to serve in some way. And so they were like, oh, okay. And so I graduate the home, and they put me to work cutting the grass. Mm -hmm. So I was tending to the the yards at the church and around the property and um, doing things like that, just cleaning the property and stuff like that. And I graduated in June, so it was very hot. And so I'm just, you know, mowing the grass in the 120-degree weather. And I was just like, well, Lord, if this is what you have for me, and but you know what jesus says if you're faithful in the little things yeah. i will grant you responsibility over the greater things yep. and you were faithful in the little things of cutting mm-hmm. the grass and and then he keeps granting you more responsibility yeah. and and more position and influence leadership yeah. obviously not for yourself but leadership is to be used as servanthood yeah right you're here to serve other people yeah. and 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 raise them up and so for those of you who are listening you know you might feel like you're in a place of quote unquote cutting grass or you know, what am I doing with my life that seems so small yeah. or insignificant? But if God has given you responsibility in that mm-hmm. area, man, just be faithful yep, to that. Faithful. You know, if you're called to scrub toilets, you better <laughs> scrub that to the glory of God. Work heartily as unto the Lord. <laughs> exactly. That's what the Bible says. And then as you're faithful, God will grant you yeah. more. Yeah. And so, okay, fast forward a little bit more. Yeah, so I just, I, I was doing that, and I was, what I was doing after work, would I would go to the mall, and I'd hand out gospel tracts, and I'd tell the gospel to Love people, it. and um, I would just me and another brother would do that a couple times a week. And one day I'm, you know, I'm just praying like, Lord, like whatever you have for me, and I'm just being like you said, being faithful in the little. And then one day I'm out front of the church cutting the trees, and Pastor Chris approached me and asked if I'd ever heard of Youth for Christ, mm-hmm. which is a ministry that goes on to high school and middle school campuses and gets to preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. And I had heard of it, so I was like, yeah, why? And then he's like, well, they're looking for a new intern. Like, would you be interested? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. So he set an interview up with Jeremiah Vick, and I went in for the interview, and they hired me, and so that's where I began ministering. So I continued, like I said, go to the mall and mm-hmm. do that outside of work. And then for my job, I got to get to go to middle school and high school campuses and preach the gospel, which is amazing because that is in many ways the enemy's territory. Mm. And we get to go right in and be a light to these students. Mm-hmm. So that's what I started doing. Awesome. And then mm-hmm. what after that? And then uh, about <laughs> a couple weeks ago, Pastor Chris approached me again and asked to speak with me and him, him and Pastor Walt. And so I went into the office and they told me that they'd been looking for a youth director in Raleigh mm-hmm. at the new Christ Community Church here where we're recording right now. Mm-hmm. And I, they asked if I would be interested in it. And 
I was like, yeah, like that sounds amazing. And so I went home and I was praying about it. And they called me in the next week and were like, okay, like, and then you came in that week and they're like, okay, it's happening. Like, mm -hmm. we're ready to move forward. And I was like, okay, like, <laughs> awesome, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where we're at now. And now me and you are working together to get this thing started. And yeah. It's been amazing. And so we're really excited to get ready to launch youth ministry. We've yeah. got a lot of projects going on here. God's been, you know, growing the work here on the north end mm -hmm. of the county. And obviously reaching and raising teenagers is just such an important part yeah. of, of the ministry. And so we're excited for what God's going to do yeah. uh, through you and the team. And so guys, yeah. be sure to be on the lookout for that and be praying for Caleb and just all the work that they're going to be doing. And yeah. so one final question before we dive into our following segments here. And the last question is this, to the person who hasn't yet given their life to Jesus, they're kind of on the fence, they've been listening, watching, not quite sure where they're at in their relationship mm -hmm. with God, what would you say to that person who hasn't quite yet made that decision? Um, that decision is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. It's literally a matter of life and death. Mm. Um, every moment we're, we're all standing on the edge of eternity. Uh, tomorrow is not promised. Even mm -hmm. your next breath is not promised. So if you are hearing the gospel right now and, you're, and you know that the call is to repent and put your faith in Christ, then I would strongly urge you to do mm -hmm. that. You know, it's, it's the most important decision you'll ever make. And not only will it save your soul, but the Lord will begin to work in your life and cause you to be a new creature. Mm -hmm. you know, you'll be born again of the Spirit and you'll get to live a life that is fulfilling, that will impact others, that you get to be a light to the world and to your mm -hmm. family and... It's just, it's a blessing. And it doesn't mean that life is going to be perfect. Sure. Jesus promised yeah. in John 16, 33, <laughs> that Quite we're going opposite. to have trials and tribulations. But the, the hope is be of good cheer, though, for I've overcome the world. Amen. So that's the hope we have. We, we go through trials. We go through these hard things. But uh, Christ is in us, and he's getting us through those things. And it's just, it's a blessing to be able to get to know him. And, and you can know him now. Yes. His prayer in John 17 was, um, when he's praying to the Father, he says, this is eternal life, that they might know you yes. and your Son whom you have sent. So eternal life begins now. You can mm -hmm. get to know him today. And the call is to repent and put your faith in him, and you can do that. Amen. Absolutely. I think that's a great way for us to finish off our conversation. Yeah. And so, Caleb, thank you so much. This has been a really, really me. special time for our audience. And yeah. so with that being said, we're going to get ready for our next segments. Caleb, thank you so much. No problem. All right. So this is our question of the month segment. So if you guys would be interested in asking us any questions in the future, you can feel free to do that via social media. So, for example, the following questions are going to be ones that were submitted to our Instagram page. So uh, this is kind of a, a fun question, and this is from the Imperial Valley Real Hope Center, which is a ministry that's near and dear to my heart, and they've asked, uh, what is your favorite part about being in full-time ministry? Great question. I've um, been serving as full-time pastor for, gosh, uh, over eight years now, mm -hmm. and when had saw this, had seen this question, I thought, oh my gosh, it's like a really big question. How do I answer that? Because uh, full-time pastoral ministry is a lot for a lot of reasons. So, for example, it's it's not a nine-to-five, you know, clock yeah. in, clock out. It's really a twenty-four-seven on yep. call. It's and it's a calling more than just an occupation or a job or mm -hmm. something like that. It's so much bigger. And then another thing is you get the opportunity and responsibility to work with people in their highest of moments of life, like yeah. a new baby or wedding or, or graduation or or obviously their salvation, which is number mm -hmm. one and most important. But then you also work with people in their lowest, most toughest moments of life, in their deepest traumas of, of um, sufferings of all kinds or divorce, marital issues, uh, child parenting issues, loss of loved ones, funerals, obviously. And so it's up and down a lot. There's yeah. a lot of emotional uh, stability that you need mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, there's been numerous times where going from a counseling session of a couple who's just so broken or an individual who's going through some really traumatic things yeah. and then going into a, doing a wedding or, mm -hmm. um, or doing something more on a higher note. And so no one day is the same as another. Mm -hmm. It's always new. It's always interesting. Um, 
And another thing on that note is that many times people expect you to wear a lot of hats mm -hmm. and expect you to wear them all well. They want you to be an amazing preacher of God's word and to break down the passages you know, yeah. beautifully. And they expect you to be an administrative organizational leader to have everything uh, and all the systems and structures in place. They expect you to be an amazing financial person and yeah. handle every bit of God's resources uh, beautifully. Yeah. They expect you to be a wonderful counselor that mm -hmm. when they come in uh, as an individual or married or have child parenting issues or whatever it might be, work issues, uh, that you would just have all the answers yeah. somehow and you're <laughs> trained as an accountant and marriage counselor and family therapist and all yeah. these other things. And so it's, uh, it's definitely challenging. Yeah. It's beautiful. It has lots of laughter, lots of tears. Um, and so there's never a dull moment. But the question was, what's my favorite part about full-time ministry? Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say seeing people's lives changed. Mm -hmm. Seeing someone experience their relationship with God for the first time to, in salvation and, yeah. and beginning to grow in Christ, that's really the most exciting. And you, Caleb, you're stepping into yeah. youth ministry. Yeah. And so, and you've already been serving in ministry for some time now. Mm -hmm. And so what is your favorite part about ministry? Yeah, so for me, I haven't quite experienced all the things that you just named. <laughs> they are things that um, I look forward to yeah. moving forward. And I'm excited to Bless you. Yeah, see how all that pans out. And But so far for me, my favorite part about being in ministry full time is just the blessing of getting to be a part of what God is doing here on earth, getting mm -hmm. to um, fulfill the Great Commission. We pray that you, your kingdom come, your will be done, and here we are. We get to be a part of his will being done and his kingdom coming here on earth. Mm -hmm. And it's a, there's a, a joy every single morning of waking up knowing that you're serving mm -hmm. the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that mm -hmm. you are um, a part of God's kingdom and that you're helping to advance his kingdom. And it's it's a joy that can't be explained with human words. It's, uh, it's an Absolutely. honor. Absolutely. Yeah. 100% agree. I think we have another question. Yes, we do. So this one's uh, on a little bit more serious note. And this question comes from Blaise Cazares. And he would like to know, does the unsaved soul suffer for eternity in hell or will it be annihilated immediately? So this is a really important topic, obviously, scripturally. And yes. it's one of those topics that a lot of people don't like to talk about or yeah. think about. But we have it's to often have a, avoided. It is often avoided for, you know, understandable reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to have a biblical understanding of yes. it. And so I do want to share two things. Number one is the scriptural reality of hell. Yes. And then number two is the logic behind hell. Because sometimes people ask the question, you know, doesn't hell seem really overkill? Like, yes. are you telling me if I lie once that I'm going to be doomed for all of eternity? Mm -hmm. That seems a bit much. And mm -hmm. so we'll talk about the logic of hell. And I'd love to hear your take on it yeah. as well. And so some of the scriptural reality of hell, I want to bring up a couple passages at least. One is out of Luke chapter 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. And then the other one is out of Revelation chapter 20 mm -hmm. in something known as the great white throne judgment. And so the scriptural reality of hell is this. And one of the things that Jesus talks about in Luke 16 is this real event between the rich man and Lazarus. And we know that this is not a parable mm -hmm. and a parable is a earthly story to explain heavenly realities or spiritual truths. Now, one of the reasons we know that Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus is a historical event as opposed to a parable is that Jesus gives real names, real people, real places, mm -hmm. as opposed to in a parable, it is more figurative language. There was a man who did this at such and such place. Yeah. And whereas with this story, rich man and Lazarus, it's real. So what happened in Luke 16? You may be familiar with the passage where the rich man went to a place called hell or Hades and Lazarus went to a place called Abraham's bosom. And this was a good holding tank, whereas hell was a bad holding tank. And at this time, we do need to extinguish a Christian myth mm -hmm. that hell is forever because the Bible does not teach that hell is forever. Hell is not forever. There's actually something else that is forever, which we'll get to that in just a bit. And so the rich man... He had consciousness. He saw Abraham. He saw Lazarus. He had memory of who they were. And then he also asked 
Abraham to send people to his brothers. Mm -hmm. So he had memory of his life on earth. He had asked for a droplet of water, you know, send Lazarus over to give a droplet of water to quench my pain. And Abraham said, I can't do that. There's a great chasm that divides us mm -hmm. uh, from us going there or you coming here. And so there was very real pain that was going on. And there was an understanding of relationship as well, mm -hmm. because he looked at Lazarus and he remembered Lazarus. And yeah. so all of these realities show us that there's consciousness in hell, there's feeling, there's remembrance of your past life. Um, and there's just a number of realities there. And here's something to think about. That rich man that asked for a droplet of water 2,000 years ago is still wanting that droplet of water today. Mm -hmm. And he will continue to do so until something happens. And then he's going to really go into suffering along with all those who've rejected the gospel. And so now <clears throat> this brings us to the other scriptural reality that hell is not forever. But Revelation 20 says that there's something called the great white throne judgment, mm -hmm. which is when hell will give up its dead, the Bible says, and they will also be resurrected mm -hmm. to a second death, the mm -hmm. Bible says. And so hell would be like jail. It's a holding place. Yes, there's suffering, the Bible teaches. And then the great white throne judgment would be like your courtroom appearance with the judge and jury and the witnesses and so forth, and where you actually get your sentencing. And then there's something after that. In Revelation 20, it talks about the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And that is what is everlasting and forevermore. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says that after hell, you're resurrected to a second death. And then you go into the lake of fire, which was prepared for Satan and his angels, who are known as demons, and all those who are in rebellion to the mm -hmm. Lord. And the lake of fire is what is forever. Hell is not forever. The lake of fire is forever. And so that's the scriptural reality mm -hmm. of this. And it's and to just press that a little bit more, hell is a place of absolute suffering. And it's a place where uh, it is never quenched. And even after one year, 10 years, 100 years of mm -hmm. suffering, 1,000 years of being in the flames and suffering God's wrath, even after 1,000 years of suffering and torment, you have barely turned page one of mm -hmm. this endless novel of the wrath of God on your sin. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality of it. And yeah. that reality for us as God's people should drive us to be about God's business, yes, to pull as many people out of the fire as possible. Yeah. And for the non-believer, it should be, it should scare them into reality. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I don't want to go there. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, well, um, it says that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, fearing God is not a bad thing. We should fear the Lord. Um, and my thoughts would be in, um, you were going to go into the logical part of it as well. And there's a, a scripture in Matthew 25 when Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them about the the people that um saw him and he's referring to uh he says that when you saw me and i was hungry and you did not feed me and they said well when did we see you and he says well whatever you did for the least of these you did for me and then he goes to the other side and he says and whatever you didn't do for the least of these you didn't do for me and at the end of the passage in matthew 25 46 he says and these referring to the ones that didn't help him uh in reference basically to the unrighteous he says and these will go away into eternal punishment, mm. but the righteous into eternal life. So that's both biblical and logical. If, if heaven is eternal, if we have eternal mm. life for those who are saved, then it would be logical that the opposite is also true for those who are unsaved. For the unconverted, mm. there is an eternal punishment. And like you said, the hell part isn't the eternal part, but there is a punishment that is eternal, mm -hmm. and that comes in the lake, the of, lake fire. of fire. And on the topic of the logic of hell, so let's now dive into the why of hell. Mm -hmm. And so imagine you as a listener, watcher, who if you lied to your parents, right, mm -hmm. there's a level of consequence, yep. right? Maybe spanking, time out, you've lost privileges, something happened, right? A consequence. Let's fast forward and let's say now you're an adult and you are in a federal court case mm -hmm. and it's a very high profile case and you put your hand on the bible and say i swear to tell the whole truth nothing but the truth so help me god and you oath uh you vow under oath to tell the whole truth in front of the judge jury the witnesses everybody mm -hmm. and then you go to the testifying stand and you lie again you lied 
as a child, you got a certain consequence, and now you lie here. It's the same sin, isn't mm -hmm. it? Lie is a lie. But now what is your consequence? Mm -hmm. Prison, right? Mm -hmm. Especially depending on the case and what was said. Now you go from just getting a spanking to now you're in prison for mm -hmm. X amount of years. Well, why did the consequence get so much greater? Mm -hmm. It was based on who you sinned against. Now let's increase that infinitely more. God, who is infinitely perfect, morally perfect in every way, he is eternal. That means that when you sin against that holy, perfect, infinite, eternal God, now your punishment is also equally eternal and perfect. Lying to your parents yields one set of consequences. Lying to a federal judge yields a greater sets of con mm -hmm. set of consequences. And lying to God, and of course we know scripturally and by our own personal mm -hmm. experience that we've done so much more against God than just lying, that we have now yielded eternal punishment. Yep. And whenever we say, gosh, hell just seems like so much, or whenever we have those kinds of thoughts, it's really because we don't truly know the holiness of God. We don't mm -hmm. truly know who God is. And we don't truly know who we are in relationship to that holy God. So it is right. It is just the logical thing to do for God to punish us in that way. Mm -hmm. And now you might be thinking, well, that seems really unloving of God to do that. And here's the reality check. God literally cannot love you more than he does right now. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his amount of love towards you, that while you and I were still sinners, Christ still died for us. Yes. What more could you want from God? Mm -hmm. He literally died for you. He cannot demonstrate his love towards you yep. any more than he already has. Yep. Do you have any thoughts else on that? No, I think you covered it pretty well. Well, thanks so much, guys, for those questions. And again, you can submit any kind of question that is on your heart and mind, or you can ask for a friend, and we'll be sure to give you a shout-out as well. Or you can ask anonymously, and that's totally fine, too. All right, so now it is time for our praise, praise reports. So, Sean, share with us what some praise reports are for this month. Yeah, so at the time that this goes out, July 1st, Friday, today we are actually finishing up our Vacation Bible School, and Monumental is our theme this year as we are discovering God's greatness together, and so it has been a really fun time for our team to decorate the building, mm -hmm. and it's been a great time with all the kids who have been coming here and getting to hear God's Word and the relationships that have yeah. been built, and so if you want to check out more uh, details about our VBS that has been going on here, you can go onto our Facebook or Instagram, and we've got recap videos and pictures about each day, and you can see what's been happening behind the scenes. And how about you, Caleb? I think that you have actually a rather big praise report to yeah, share. Yeah, I do. So we have now uh, uh, announced that the Christ Community Church Brawley Youth Ministry is going to be starting. It's going to be starting on August 31st. So the ball's starting to roll. We're starting to get some volunteers and we're just excited to see what God is going to do here through this youth ministry. And he's raised me up to be the director of it. So I'm excited to be a part of this and get to come alongside all my brothers and sisters here and see how this goes. Absolutely. We're praying for Caleb. We're cheering him on. And if you want to play a role in the youth ministry here, then we would encourage you to contact us and uh, let you let us know how you would like to play your part in reaching teenagers and raising them up in discipleship. Yes. So now we are moving into our What Are You Learning segment. So, Sean, share with me. What are you learning? <laughs> and share with, share with our friends. Um, right now, I recently started reading a book called The Root of the Righteous by A.W. Tozer, which if you've never read any of Tozer's books, I really encourage you to do so. He writes in a slightly older style, but it's always just so good, so profound, and the idea behind the root of the righteous is that many times people focus on the fruit or the results mm -hmm. that people are producing. Like, man, look at this business that they did or this church is doing amazing things or this individual is just rocking it in this area as yeah. a you know, family person or in their business or work or whatever it might be. But they often don't look at what did it take to get there. Mm -hmm. And so the idea behind Tozer's book, Root of the Righteous, is 
how do we get to the root of the matter and how do we develop strong character and godliness and relationship with the Lord and that root that then uh, allows us to produce those kinds of amazing fruit and, and uh, results that people yeah. often see. So that's what I'm currently learning right now in a book form. Um, always listening to podcasts throughout yeah. the week and that kind of thing. But uh, Mr. Caleb, what are you learning? So I recently started a book called Always Ready by Greg Bonson. And essentially it's an apologetics book. So I recently got into listening to apologetics podcasts and messages and debates and things like that. How nerdy. I, uh, I, I guess, love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. It's been awesome. It's been a cool journey. And so I, I recently got this book and it's a way to equip you to also mm-hmm. be able to do apologetics, which I think is uh, necessary for every believer. I mean, we're told to always be ready to mm-hmm. give a defense for our hope that we have. So I'm excited to learn how to do that. Awesome. And we would love to see what you are learning or most curious about right now. So why don't you type that up in the comments and we'd love to talk with you about what you're learning. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. We encourage you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Be sure to comment below what you found most helpful or interesting and... And make sure to smash that like button. Amen. All right. We'll see you in the next episode.